Okay, so I think we've got our speakers here, so we, we might as well get started. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone back to our rounds, um, and I'd like to officially welcome every, uh, wish everyone a happy National Physicians Day. Um, and we, this is a combined presentation between the COS and the Department of Ophthalmology. And I will hand it off to Dr. John Lloyd to handle introductions. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. So as everybody knows, uh, in the spring, we have a combined uh, Department of Vision Science and TOS uh, Grand Rounds. And uh, this is typically a lovely way to start the spring. And uh, for many years, uh, kudos to Dr. Yoganathan for arranging fantastic venues. So we have a little bit of a <coughs> downgrade this year. But <coughs> I'm sure it'll be more than made up for by the fabulous topic and the wonderful panelists we have joining us today. Now, the uh, president of the TOS uh, has uh, switched to Dr. Malecki, but I guess he cannot join us today. So as past president, Deepa is going to uh, lead us off, say a few words for the TOS and introduce our speakers and panelists. Welcome, Deepa. Thank you, John. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, everything looks good. Okay, perfect. Um, so, Welcome to uh, the Combined Spring Grand Rounds, um, sponsored by the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at University of Toronto and the Toronto, Toronto Ophthalmological Society. Uh, Lee Jampol will be um, giving us his keynote uh, lecture in just a minute. Uh, I wanted to update you on behalf of Babak uh, Malaki. He um, was called into the operating room, so he could not give his uh, presidential um, address, so to speak. Uh, so I wanted to um, mention that we do have a new executive. So there are new, um, um, uh, new people involved at the TOS. So Steve Arshinoff and I are now past presidents. Uh, Babak is president. Uh, Jonathan Michelli is vice president. Natalie Pesson is our um, treasurer, and Kay Lamb is our secretary. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Katharina Gasser um, is now um, the woman behind the scenes who helps organize all of these um, amazing events. Uh, we had a lovely uh, gala planned at the uh, Gardner Museum last night. Of course, we had to cancel that. Uh, we will hopefully do that in 2021. Uh, our golf fundraiser had to be canceled. Um, hopefully we will do that in 2021 as well. Uh, our next event, um, October 30th, uh, 2020, um, is still on the schedule uh, until further notice. Uh, we have planned that at the Globe and Mail. It will be uh, Manjul Shaw from University of Michigan, um, uh, who will be talking about UGG syndrome. Um, and so for more updates, just go to uh, tos2020.com. Uh, I wanted to introduce the panelists uh, for today before uh, Dr. Yan gives the introduction to Dr. Jampol. Uh, so we have a very special guest, Larry Yanuzzi uh, from uh, New York City, who will be joining us today. Unfortunately, Dr. Yanuzzi's camera is not working, so we cannot um, see his lovely face, uh, but his voice uh, dominates and we will all recognize when he speaks. Uh, and that's a photo uh, on the top left of uh, the last TOS event uh, on the rooftop of the Globe and Mail. Uh, we have from University of Toronto, Panos Christakis, Peter Curtis, Kayvon Kushan, David Wong, uh, Peng Yan, of course. Um, so, um, Peng, would you like to do your introduction? Sure. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for another round of this combined uh, Department of Ophthalmology and Toronto Ophthalmology meeting. With our special guest, Dr. Jampo, it's an honor to have you and thanks for a great presentation this morning for the resident teaching. Now, Dr. Jampo graduated uh, from Yale uh, Medicine and Ophthalmology, followed by Retina Fellowship, specializing in retinal vascular disease at the University of Illinois. He's a full faculty member at the Northwest University. His career is focused on clinical trials, inflammatory disease of the retina, all the multiple white dot syndromes, Central serous corneal retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy. He was the chair of the DRCR. 1985, Dr. Jampo has been extensively involved in data monitoring and 
funding of critical uh, clinical trials. A lot of these are pivotal trials that most of us are uh, familiar with, including the macular photocoagulation study, submacular surgery trial, um, and uh, my internet sounds is, is a little bit unstable, so hopefully it doesn't get interrupted. Um, also, the standard of care versus corio, uh, corticosteroid for renal vein occlusion, and as well as chair for DR with uh, evidence for the treatment of diabetes and macular uh, edema. Uh, Dr. Chempel has al also served as a president of the American Society of Ophthalmological Society, the vice president of ARVO, the Association of Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, president of Macular Society, and the chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Northwestern University. Uh, his achievement goes on and on, and he's also named numerous renal diseases, including uh, multiple evanescent white dot syndrome, unifocal heloid choroiditis, torpedo maculopathy, and uh, West Nile virus retinitis. Over 50 years of practice, he trained numerous fellows residents, published over 500 papers, uh, peer-reviewed, as a leading figure in ophthalmology. So I asked him, you know what, does he have time for anything else? So he, so he uh, replied and he said he plays the five-string uh, bluegrass mandrel, runs 27 uh, full marathons, best time is two hour 56 uh, minutes uh, for the Montreal Marathon, remains a long distance biker, uh, swimmer, and uh, he also participate in a triathlon. So he's truly an Ironman. So his achievement goes on and on. The list is way too long. So without further ado, the one and only Dr. Jample. Oh, thank you. So explain to me uh, the panel, how that works. As, um, how do I use the panel? So well, you can use the panel as however you'd like, but um, it, it depends if you are comfortable with um, us interrupting you uh, while you speak to further clarify some points, or we can save questions, um, save our questions to the end of the session. I'll leave that up to you. Okay, so I don't, I'm very comfortable with interruptions. I expect some interruptions from Dr. Yanusi, so. <laughs> so, okay, let's get started. Um, let me just ask Dr. Yunudzi, um, do you know how to unmute yourself if you need to? Um, it's a button on the bottom. Oh, bottom there. left, right. Perfect. So the That's problem it. with Dr. Yunudzi is teaching him how to mute, mute himself. I know, I know from experience. So, <laughs> all right, let's get started. <laughs> Now, as Peng is loading up the slides, we are going to launch a quick poll. Um, so there we go. So the poll question should be up on your screen. Yes, are you welcome? So this is the first poll, basically asking everyone where they're from. We'll let that run for a few seconds. It's always nice to know where the audience is from. And so we've got, we've got most, oh, you know, I'm going to turn off some background noise. We've got a lot of people from Toronto and Canada, but we've got a mix of people from around the world. And now we also have a relevant question here um, before we start to talk about patients with PDR. What is your treat, primary treatment of choice or your first treatment of choice? And I'm gonna let this run for just a couple more seconds here while we get some results in. We've got about 50% of the audience participating and we've got a nice mix there. So I think it's really relevant to have this talk. So we've got about 43% uh, voting for PRP, 34 for a combination of anti-VEGF and PRP and 22% saying anti-VEGF monthly. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Jampol. That's a great question for the lecture, okay. So we're going to start out with diabetic macular edema, and then we're going to discuss proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So um, the landmark study of DRCR, as far as I'm concerned, is protocol T, where I uh, hope, hope most of you are familiar. But for diabetic macular edema with vision loss, we divided um, the patients um, into various categories based upon the drug that they were receiving, a flibicept, bevacizumab or ranibizumab. And then we followed them for two years. Uh, we had a certain treatment regimen and we found at the end of two years that the patients who received aflibicept 
and had vision worse than 2050 did better than the other two drugs. Whereas when the vision was better than 2050, all three drugs were about the same. And that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And we'll just show you, next slide, we'll show you quickly. So the patients had type one and type two diabetes. They received one of the three drugs and they were followed for two years. Next slide. And so on the left, the patients that had good vision, 2032 to 2040, and you can see that all three drugs were the same for two years. Whereas patients on the right that had vision of 2050 or worse at entry did significantly better with a flibicep than the other two drugs. Okay, next slide. Um, so then we decide, so that's been widely disseminated and I think it's changed the way that diabetic macular edema is treated throughout the world. Um, where a is available um, and can be afforded, I think it's a better treatment. Go back, please. Um, you skipped the slide. Where it's affordable, we recommend that a flibicept be used, whereas if the vision is good, then any of the three drugs are about the same. All right, then we decided to find out what happens after five years in the same patient groups. And this is similar to what was done with the CAT study with macular degeneration. So the patients were unsupervised by us between years two and five, but we wanted to find out if there was any difference, um, how they did, we wanted to see how they did at year five. Um, I think if you remember the CAT study for AMD, uh, all of the benefit overall for treatment with the anti-VEGF drugs was already gone by five years for AMD. Uh, we wanted to see if that happened to the diabetic macular edema patients as well. So we, we tried to get back all of the patients at five years, okay? And then at that point, we got their ocular history, their medical history, the records where we could obtain them and did a full eye exam. Fortunately, a lot of the patients were still cared for by the same retinal specialist. So we had good carry, uh, follow up on the patients that we could reach, okay? Uh, some of the patients were too sick, some of the patients were not reachable. And so at the end of five years, we only had about two thirds of the patients still available at five years for this exam. Okay, so what did we find? Next slide. Uh, so we're, we're asking questions, how many of the, uh, can we break those out? Try the next slide. Uh, so primary objective of, for the three years after protocol P, did the par participants continue to see a retinal specialist? Next slide. Next slide. What treatments have been given between years two and five? We knew in detail what we gave up to two years. Next slide. Did the vision change between two years and five years? Next slide. Uh, what happened to the central subfield thickness between two years and five years? Next slide. How many eyes still had DME? Next slide. We were not trying to compare the three drugs at five years because there were so many variations of patients switching drugs. Uh, so we, we, have ab we abandoned any thought at the beginning that we'd be able to learn anything from seeing which drug they were on at five years. Okay, so we're just trying to find out what happened to them as a group because the management between two years and five years was at the clinician's discretion. Next slide. Uh, next slide, move on. All right, so we had 558 patients that were available and alive at two years. And what, hap what happened to those patients? Well, about 95 of them had died. Um, we have non-participants and we have participants. So we were able to get about 67% of the participants back. Okay, next slide. And if we looked at the participants, the ones that said, yes, you can do the exam in five years, or the others that were dead or unavailable, you can see that they're pretty well balanced. Um, the vision is a little worse, mean visual acuity scores a little worse in the eyes that were not participant. And that sort of makes sense. Okay, otherwise they were well balanced. Next slide. Okay. and. How many of them had any retinal follow-up between two and five years? And 
um, almost all of them had at least one retinal exam, and most of them had a lot more than one retinal exam. Okay, next slide. Uh, the mean number, see, I have to get rid of this stuff on the right. Here we go. The mean number of visits per participant between years two and five was 14. So these patients really, uh, the majority of them continued to be followed. And 98% of those visits occurred at the same site that they entered the study, which shows a lot of allegiance to our doctors. Next slide. Okay. And what treatments had they received for DME since protocol T ended? You can see a, a variety of treatments, but um, the three anti-VEGF drugs were pretty similar in terms of the ones we used. Next slide. A few of them got steroid, a few of them got laser. And how many injection, injections did they receive after two years? The median number of injections was four. That means half of them got more than four and half of them got less than four. But you can see way to the right that some patients got as many as 28 injections. Okay, pretty well spread out. Next slide. Here's the upper end of the scale. You can see that quite a few of them got some injections even two years out. Next slide. Okay, so what we found out is that two thirds came back that the vast majority of those were being followed by retinal specialists. They got a mean of four shots between years um, two and five. And that number of shots is not too different than what we found with our own experience in a five-year study. So we, it seems as though the patients are being well followed between years two and five. Next slide. So what happened to the visual acuity? So here we go, overall group, all the drugs, we can see we got an improvement of 12.3 letters. That's two and a half lines on the chart at two years. And then they were still a lot better than baseline at five years. They were a line and a half better than the baseline. But you can see that we've lost the line of vision, a little more than the line of vision uh, between two years and five years. But this is much better than macular degeneration where they lost virtually all, they actually were lower at five years than they were at baseline. So th this disease is quite different than age-related macular degeneration. And don't try to extrapolate any information about AMD anti-VEGF treatment from, from AMD to diabetic macular edema. So we still have benefited the patients, but not as much as in two years. Next slide. So the mean change between two and five years was 4.7 letters. That's one line, basically. Next slide. Okay, now what about looking at the good vision group and the bad vision group, okay? Next slide. So we found that all three drugs showed a drop between two and five years, okay? So it wasn't that one drug lasted longer than the others. They all were about the same, years two to five. The drug that's listed here is the drug that they started in, not the one that we were receiving at the end. Next slide. Now, if we looked at the good vision eyes, remember in the good vision eyes, all three drugs were the same at two years. At five years, they're still the same. If we look at the uh, 20 or 50 worse eyes, all of them dropped between two and five years. About the same amount too. Okay, next slide. Okay, so if we looked at the 2025 or better vision, 2032, we don't see much difference between um, the visions at one year, two years, and five years in terms of the percentages. Next slide. What happened to, so we've already seen the vision drop, but not, not all the way down. What happened to the central subfield? Okay, so here's up to two years, all three groups combined. You see they thinned out about 156 microns. Now we go out to five years and they stay on the average exactly the same. So even though the vision dropped five letters of one line, their thickness stayed about the same. And that's an interesting finding that we haven't completely explained. Next slide.
Okay, if we look at the three drugs again, we can see um, bevacizumab thin the retina the least at two years. Now we go out to five years and they're all about the same in terms of thinning of the retina. So there is a discrepancy between vision and thinning, which is what we find in a lot of our studies. Lee, it's David Wong. Uh, it's a quick question. Um, you may be looking at the future, but do you think there's any role of macular ischemia in these cases, given that there's no anatomical change to cause of these visual changes? Yeah. Okay, so it turns out that for patients with DME as the cause of their vision loss who are eligible to enter in our study, that we really don't see much effect of macular ischemia on the outcomes. And if we look at the angiograms, that's not a factor. Okay. But it's, it's interesting that ischemia may not be related to the outcomes in these patients, I mean, the development of ischemia. Lee, I just came on Kushan. I just want to follow Dave's question. Was the phakic status uh, any relevance here? Uh, um, yes, yeah, so some of our patients did get cataract surgery. If we looked at the pseudo fakes versus the phakic patients, the same findings, the dro same drop in vision, and the same stable visual acuity, uh, central subfield thickness. Okay, so that's not the answer. Cataract development is not the answer. So that was, certainly would be one factor you would suspect between years two and five, but that was not the cause. Okay, next, next slide. So the five-year data is published, and if you're interested in seeing it in more detail, um, it's available. So if you look at the thickness, which we said as it overall doesn't change between two and five years, if you look at the breakdown for less than 250 microns, 250 to 400, more than 400, that also doesn't change between two and five years. So not much is going on with the thickness, but something may well be going on with the underlying disease. And in the, the lectures that I gave you this morning, uh, you asked about ischemia. I don't think that's the factor, but if you I'd like to I gave this morning, I pointed out that there's more evidence developing that diabetic retinopathy is actually a, a neuropathy, that the vasculopathy we see is only a manifestation of that. And we find that the field decreases even when the patients are being treated with anti-VEGF or PRP. And we think that the, there's a neuropathy component to diabetic retinopathy, which is not reflected in the um, diabetic retinopathy severity scale. Um, that's a very complex issue. I'd have to give you a 45 minute lecture on that. But anyway, it's clear that the vision dropped and the thickness didn't drop. Okay, next slide. So the limitations of the five year study, well, we only got back two thirds and that, but as clinical trialists, that really bothers us. But we did an amazingly complete job of getting who we could. The treatments were uncontrolled for years two and five, so we can't comment on the individual drugs, except to say that uh, the changes were the same for all three drugs. Okay, next slide. Um, so 95% of the patients got retinal care. That's good. 68% received at least one injection. Um, most of them were followed pretty well and got four injections as a mean. Uh, the vision dropped, but was better than baseline. Okay. Now, when we did a protocol I, which was similar patients, except they um, uh, they were followed for five years under our supervision, we actually didn't find a drop between years two and five. They got the same number of shots between years two and five, but their vision didn't drop, and that's unexplained. So when you're doing these clinical trials, sometimes the most interesting findings are the ones you don't expect. And that's the that's difference between protocol I, where the vision stayed stable, and protocol T, where it dropped, is interesting. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, so now, after we did protocol T, remember protocol T required the vision to be down with DME, okay? They had to be thick and 20, 32 or worse. But half of our patients with DME, with central thickness, have a normal vision. So the next question was, what should we do with those patients? Should they be treated uh, with anti-VEGF? So that's protocol V. So all of them had a thick fovea, but 20, 25 or better vision. Next slide. How should we treat them? Next slide. 
we have a choice. We could start in DigestF right away and follow our algorithms. We could do laser right away, or we could observe the patients, okay? Uh, we're gonna come back and tell you that observation is a very good choice. Okay, so let's go back. All right, so um, the outcome was a loss of five letters of vision in two years. Okay, and then we looked at thickness also. Next slide. So we're comparing no treatment, focal laser treatment, or a thurbicep. But there's one thing you have to keep in mind, that is uh, if the observation group or the laser group lost vision, at that point, they were treated with a flibicep. So we're really comparing that flibicep all along to laser starting, but if they needed um, treatment because their vision dropped, they got a flibicep. That was about a third of them that got that. And the observation group, where more than half of them never needed anything more than observation. But if they did go down, they got a flibicep. I'm gonna go over that again for you. So next slide. All right, and we got very good retention in the study. Okay, next slide. And they got it, the, the regimens, uh, I won't go over in detail, but if they got laser, they were retreated if, if they got vision loss. And if they got an observation and if they got vision loss, they were treated with a for the same. Okay, next slide. All right, and so the, the three groups were well balanced between a flibicep, laser to start, observation to start. Same thickness, same visions. Next slide. Okay, and how many visits did they, we have an algorithm telling you how many visits we should give. And um, they had about 10 visits in the flibicep group because they were getting more shots. In the observation laser groups, about six in years, Two, they were about the same number of shots, but they still required shots for two years. Now, I'll, I'll just remind you that in our protocol eye data, after two years, the patients get, and those patients are worse, they get very few shots. So, so these number of shots we expected. Next slide. So what happened to the vision in the three groups? Next slide. So five letters lost. So how many patients, that was our primary outcome. How many are going downhill? based upon where they started. And you can see all three groups are the same. At two years, only less than a fifth of the patients uh, had lost to five letters of vision. Okay, next slide. That's, that's surprising. What about 10 letters lost? So this is a pretty bad loss in two years. Exactly the same in the three groups. Okay, what, if, what about improvement? Next slide. Five letters gain. Now, they all started with good vision, so they can't improve very much. But if you look, about a quarter of them did improve five letters. Again, basically the same, whether you start with observation, laser, or a flibicide. Next slide. Um, what about eyes that are 20, 20 or better at two years? Well, the flibicide group did a little better than the other two groups. But remember that the mean visual acuity is the same. Okay, mm -hmm. next slide. So there is a hint that a flibicep did a little better. So here's a plot of the mean visual acuity starting around 85 letters, normal vision, and ending up at 85 letters, 2020 vision, at two years. And it didn't matter which drug you started with. You'll notice that the flibicep group did a little bit better at the beginning, but you're only talking about one and a half letters. Okay. Yeah. Let's go on. Next slide. Okay. So, what about central subfield thickness? Let's do that. So, as you might expect, the aflibicep group thinned out compared to the other two groups. But by the time we reach two years, the thickness is the same. Okay. So, not only is the vision the same at two years, but the thickness is the same at two years. Okay. Next slide. BME treatments. Okay, let's take a look at that. All right, so we look at the various groups that, that weren't getting a flibicept. How long did it take them to get a flibicept and how many of them got it? So let's start with the green, the observation group. At the end of two years, about a third of them, because they'd gone down, required a flibicept. That means that two thirds of these patients 
were spared uh, the risks and the and the time and the expense of doing atrial disseptive injections. If you started with laser, less of them needed atrial disseptive. About 26%, about a quarter needed atrial disseptive. And remember, at the end of two years, they were doing the same. So what we basically conclude, and I'll say this again, is that the three out the three treatment regimens ended up the same at two years. Next slide. Okay. Next slide, we'll skip that one. So the cumulative eyes receiving at least one injection, cumulative initiation, 8.3 in the Flibicept group and the LACI groups also got almost as many injections after two years. Next slide. Now, what about safety? Well, you, you'd expect it all would be very safe, and that's what we found. Okay, Flibicept group, laser, and observation all did very well. Next slide. And if we look at systemic adverse events, they all did the same, basically. So same safety. So in summary, they had to have thick center, normal vision. There was no difference of, of vision in two years among the groups. And all ended up with a mean vision of 2020. And the majority of the ones that started with LASIK never had to have this with set. And the two thirds of the ones that started in observation never received any of this. So, Dr. Temple, can no. you um, can you comment on, you know, in in clinical trials, um, the patients that enter clinical trials often have very well controlled diabetes. Can you comment on their um, A1C? And my second question uh, that was from the from the audience. And my second question is, um, did you expect these results? Is this is this what you expected to happen based on your prior clinical practice? Yeah, okay, so let's start with the first. So in our studies, anyone that's t wildly out of control, like an A1C of 12 is not eligible. They presented me a patient this morning with an A1C of 12.4. That would not have been allowed into our study. But a lot of them, uh, the, I think the mean A1C was 8.2 or something like that, which is not perfect, but not, not, not terrible, but somewhere in the middle. Okay, so can you extrapolate this to a very poorly controlled patient? Probably not. The first thing I would do in that patient is work with the internist to get that patient down. Because not only is that patient's eyes going to do poorly, but they're going to die with an A1C of 12. So, okay. The second question again was? Is this what you expected based on your prior clinical experience that all three groups would end up being pretty similar. Yeah, okay, so as I said, they all started with good vision, so we, we didn't really expect a difference in improved vision, okay? But we did thought that there was a pretty good chance that the worsening over the course of two years, since they were already thick outside the normal range, might be worse in the observation group and the best in the equivocet group with the laser probably falling in between. Okay, so we were surprised that they tracked exactly on top of each other. Dr. Gamble. Uh, Larry, that was a very good summary and an overview of the diabetic question. I'm surprised you had such great looking slides, Lee. They were terrific, don't you think, Deepa? They were... I would like to ask you a very similar question. When you analyze this data at the very end, after five years, what surprised you the most? What didn't you expect? Okay, so first I have to announce a conflict of interest. Dr. Inus and I are very close friends. <laughs> and yes. <laughs> I, I know he wouldn't throw me a hardball question. <laughs> well, that's a hard question. Yeah, so I would say that we were very surprised that, that three quarters of the patients with laser and two thirds of the patients with observation never needed any treatment for two years. Do you know how much money that saves everybody? Do you know how much time and effort, you know, the risks of end up for Midas with injections? So we were really surprised about that. And we did a, a cost analysis that we're working on right now to show you how much money we save with this type of uh, uh, starting with observation. 
Okay. Well, I'll tell you, that didn't surprise me as much as one of the other outcomes. The, the um, I, in fact, for since I've been in practice for past decades, <laughs> uh, I always pause before treating a patient, whether it's observation, or we only had laser in those days. And I wanted to see what better control. Patients are usually a little frightened when you tell them that you need intervention of any sort. Just the idea of, of getting back and forth to the office and cost. Yeah. You know, so, so they take better care of themselves. So I always change the starting line. The starting line from when they were maximally controlled on medication and by themselves. When they did it, they're not so compliant, as you know. Okay, so Larry, so what surprised me, okay. I'll finish it, was that after five years, laser was as good as pharmacological treatment. Because I, I think, I think if you used um, um, macular scanning uh, or macular uh, uh, imaging, well, field uh, testing, um, you might see scotomatous changes or some effect in the near vision. And I'll bring that up again if there's time because that's my last question. Okay, so remember that about a third of the LASIK group requires some aflibiceptor in the two years. So this is not, it was only two years, not five years in the study. And if this is not a direct comparison of LASIK versus aflibiceptor, like you're saying, but it's a comparison of aflibiceptor versus starting with laser and giving aflibiceptor if it deteriorates, and that's only a third of the cases. Yeah. Um, and I think that there were wise people that weren't so anxious to jump in with treatment, uh, as you point out, and, but there were other people that were treating everybody, they were extrapolating protocol T and saying that anti-FEGF is gonna be better and you might as well start it earlier. And that's clearly not the case. So, so um, I, I think that's a very important point you made. Well, the, I do have another question, and that is these patients like macular degeneration, people who are technically legally blind, 2200, can come up to you and say, well, I see everything. It's just that I can't read. Have you ever heard that from a patient Lee, and tell me why any of these studies do not incorporate near vision. Yeah, so, uh, so I don't have a good answer for the discrepancy you're pointing out, but we have done near vision in our some of the studies. Uh, I can't recall if we did it in protocol V, and we, we have found that it, it parallels our results for the distance, but in terms of efficacy of the treatments, but we haven't uh, explain that there can be a discrepancy between the two. Yeah, well, I brought that up at the MPS study, one of the earlier trials that we had. And nobody could agree on how to test the near vision. What do you use, a plus three at a certain distance uh -huh. or a certain distance yeah, with so, a plus five? So we, yeah, have, a, we have the standard uh, near vision measurement with, with uh, the proper correction on a reading chart. So. Um, I, I can't give you any more details because I wasn't involved with uh, testing the patients. So the last question has to do with central retinal thickening. You didn't do microperimetry, did you? No. But, I, okay. so we, yeah, that, what that, is the value of central retinal thickening? Okay, great question. So first of all, microperimetry we haven't been able to do in our any of our studies because number one, it's not available in the vast majority of retinal practices in our study, um, almost all. And second of all, nobody's ever shown exactly what it means when you get deficits in terms of uh, functioning. So uh, I think microperimetry on cases like this would be interesting, but we don't have any data on it. So what about retinal thickening? What is the value of that? Okay, so I talked- My about, fellows tell me I don't do enough of that. Okay, so we talked, again, we're talking about diabetes only. We talked about that a little bit with the residents this morning. 
If you look at the correlation between central retinal thickness, which is probably the best way to measure thickening, and visual acuity, and we've written papers on this, <clears throat> the correlation is 0.3, R equals 0.3, which is a terrible correlation. And that means that the thickness only explains about 10%, 9 or 10% of the fluctuation in vision and the relationship to thickness. And some of it's obvious. If the retina dies, it gets thin and it's not thick anymore. But it's much more complex than that. And we're hoping, we're hoping that applying artificial intelligence to the, C, to the OCT scans, artificial AI and OCT, may give us much more information from the OCT than central retinal thickness. That's again, Paul. So was that, was that a yes or a no in terms of its importance? It's the best we have right now. And when we're standing there with the needle trying to decide whether to give the shots, it's the best that we have, assuming the vision's still down, obviously. Well, I asked you another question. Is that a yes or a no? Is it important? <laughs> Deepa, <will> you, <laughs> we joke around a lot. So. Okay. Um, if, you can't get, if you can't get the answer you want, I won't be able to either. Can yeah, I just, that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> can, I follow, can I follow up on, on Dr. Yanuti's question there? Is, um, you know, you talk about central retinal thickness, but how about macular volume um, is, as a correlation? Has that been looked at? Because this is actually, at least my thinking, is a three-dimensional disease, not a pinpoint disease. You're right, it's three-dimensional, and you're right, we have looked at it, and it didn't add any additional information in terms of prediction of what has happened or what's going to happen to central subfield thickness. Well, that's a good question, though, David. Glad you brought it up because I think macular volume is important for AMD, non exudative or intermediate, before it gets neovascularized. But that's another lecture. Yeah, with DME, I don't think it adds anything. And some of us, that yeah. we did it for a while, and now I think we've gone back to not doing it for that reason. Nor do I. Okay. So, a couple well, quick questions that, from actually. the audience here. Uh, one question was for the observation group, what was the interval between follow ups? Um, the observation group. Uh, so remember, the vision's normal and they have thickness. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was a minimum of three monthly. And then if the vision went down slightly, it was moved up more frequently, maybe six weekly. So it's, Great, a, thank you. it's a pretty complicated algorithm, but it was at least every three months. Every three months. And then a follow-up question from about the diabetic control earlier. So we, we talked about excluding poorly controlled diabetics, so A1C of 12, for example. But they followed up with a question about, um, I guess they're asked the same question, how does diabetic control affect the outcomes? But they're saying an A1C above or below 7. Can any of the panelists comment on that? Okay, so you like to get your patients under 7. So in that sense, I understand the question. But there's a, there's a uh, direct correlation between the level of hemoglobin A1C and the eye complications and the systemic complications. So eight is better, than, is worse than seven, and nine is worse than eight, and 10. So it, it's, not, it's not a sudden cutoff like that. It's not a binary outcome. Uh, it's a linear relationship between the two. I'm in deep. Um... Nupra has a question, and then do you want to launch the poll? Absolutely. Nupra, go ahead first, and then I'll sure. do the poll next. Uh, thanks, Dr. Jampol. I had a question, oh, maybe. So one, one second. The poll is on proliferative diabetic retinopathy, so we haven't gotten to that yet. Um, so what do you do in your patients, as you were saying, if you're standing there with the needle and the patients are 20, 25 or better, what, what is your clinical practice? Uh, so we're, we are all thoroughly convinced that observation is the best initial management, as long as you have a reliable patient to come back for vision and thickness checks. And if the thickness starts to go down and the vision is still good, mm -hmm. we see the patients more frequently. If the vision starts to go down, once they get down to, I can tell you, if they're down five to nine letters on two visits or more than 10 letters on one visit, then we start treating with aflibercept. Okay, thank you. I'm happy he said that, aren't you? Yes, especially relevant now in the COVID era. So that means we don't have to feel as bad if we're not doing anything. So, I mean, it's really terrible what to do with these patients in the COVID era because you don't want to get too close to them to begin with. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, 
you don't want to scan them every visit because that uh, puts your photographers and technicians at risk. And um, there's no, we're, we're trying hard to find a middle road where we're doing the minimum testing, the minimal exams, but still not letting the patients get worse. But one thing I could comment on that is with DME, it's different than AMD. So when the vision goes down two weeks or a month, or maybe even six weeks, doesn't make a difference to DME. And you can sort of push the visit back to the really thorough exam when hopefully things won't be quite as bad. So. Um, Lee, can I just uh, follow that question uh, with another one? From time to time, you get a young diabetic who gets a little cystic edema, and vision is still 20-20, but they're symptomatic. Uh, what would you do with that one? Does this protocol apply to that type of patient who's symptomatic but with good vision? Do you still observe that one or just going to do it individually? So, yeah, so if it's an airline pilot or someone that really requires better than 20-25 vision, uh, we, would, we would not think that's unreasonable to treat that patient. But a lot of patients, the other thing I didn't mention about the study is that I would definitely, and Larry said this really, I would follow the patients for a while because sometimes they'll come back a month later, um, and their DME is gone. That happens all the time. We're going to have a paper on that. It fluctuates up and down. It's not easily explained by their A1C, but it fluctuates up and down. And sometimes none of them does it ever come back. So we really don't like to treat the patients in the observation group until they've had sustained drop in vision um, and not a one visit thing, unless it's really marked. And the other thing I would make is change in the diabetic control and some patients can really thin the retina dramatically. So always go in that direction at first if it's a really high A1C. Oh, I'm glad you said that too, because I have never had a patient with a good explanation of the edema, what it represents and what it does to the vision, yeah. and not accept temporizing before intervention. And invariably, they can come back in five pounds lighter, improvement in their biochemistries, and uh, happy about uh, the resolution spontaneously of the edema. Of course, if it gets worse, you've given them the opportunity to uh, avoid uh, intervention, and they appreciate that too. Now, there's a fair number of patients in the observation group that on one visit had decreased vision or increased thickness that never required any treatment for two years. So, uh, the, the other thing I want to say is, if you follow a patient for longer, 10 years, 20 years, those laser marks tend to expand. Howie Schatz called it creep, progressive creep from photocoagulation, which is RPE atrophy around the laser marks. So if you did a grid, for example, with no noticeable abnormalities in a year, two years, five years, 10 years, you could start to see some of the atrophy and it could be confluent and meaningful functionally. Yeah. So I, I warn you of that. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't like grids very much. So, but I'll make one other comment. I'm sure you've seen this, Larry. Uh, sometimes I'll see a patient that I lasered 25 years ago for diabetic macular edema and they'll come in and they don't have any edema or any retinopathy really, it's all regressed. And they look at me, Dr. Jampo, what did you treat here? There wasn't any retinopathy there. And so time, with time, many people, many people can um, improve and, and the retinopathy can disappear. So that's a good reason to not treat unless you have to. You know, and those people who improve like that unexpectedly, they don't have a good explanation. They haven't lost weight. Their blood pressure is still labile, and their hemoglobin A1C is not doing so great. Why? But generally, they have learned to take better care of themselves, and that's the association. Okay. So now, you, now you're stuck in a tough question, which I didn't talk about, but let's see what people say. So I'll discuss it. Yeah, so this is a poll that is um, related to, a little bit related to your talk uh, before you launch into the next uh, topic of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So the poll says, for severe phakic diabetic macular edema, 
who have not improved 20% of their central retinal thickness after three anti-VEGF injections, what do you do next? Do you continue for a total of six anti-VEGF injections? Do you switch anti-VEGF agents after three? Do you try focal or grid laser? Do you switch to steroids? And if so, steroids, which kind of steroid? Is it Ozerdex, Alluvian, or Triessence? And so we've, we've got the not, results here. We did not give an option of other. That's a good question. And so the audience is pretty split. About 40% would continue for six months and about 40% or 42% would switch to the anti-VEGF agent. So with that, we'll give the slides back to uh, Tip Peng and Dr. John Cole. So do you, do you want to have the panel comment or should I just go ahead? Let's start. Else? Okay. So so we recommend six shots, and that's based upon some data analysis that we showed that patients with continue to improve the six shots. Uh, the vest on the mean vision is improving and the thickness is still improving out to six shots. So I we stick with the same agent in most cases for six shots. I think when you get to six, it's very reasonable to switch anti-VEGF agents. Uh, as you know, we think that a flibicept when eyes with uh, markedly decreased vision do better. Um, focal grid, the interesting thing is I don't think we know the role of focal grid in the anti-VEGF era because in all of our early, earlier studies, we did focal grid if they weren't doing well. Um, in the later studies, we're not doing focal grid. And we haven't done a study which with a thorough anti-VEGF treatments, does focal grid make any difference? So I'm not sure about that one. I think that steroids are indicated um, when you get out to six shots, it's a, something to think about, particularly in the pseudophagic eye. Um, people say, well, so what if they get a cataract? Well, I think in some of these old sick patients, it makes a difference. So after six, um, and maybe you've tried switching to a flibicept, then I think steroid is a reasonable choice. Um, I think I would probably go with the short-acting steroids rather than the real long-acting steroids. I would answer that slightly differently. First of all, don't overlook uh, lipids, lipid chemistry. Of course, if there's a lot of lipid in the fundus, you've already discussed lowering the uh, lipid chemistry in a given patient, and that is useful because if it's elevated in the bloodstream, it tends to be more copiously deposit, deposited in the fundus. And uh, the second thing is, I would look for incriminating inner and nowadays even deep large capillary uh, aneurysms. And I wouldn't use a grid, but I would focally, very minimally consider adding laser photocoagulation. And I haven't found any uh, trial yet that says that that's bad. And I know that in some patients, the use of the laser, whether it stimulates a patient to be more diligent in his or her care, or whether it is sealing the aneurysm as we would to eliminate lipid with a macro aneurysm, okay, there's no proof that that should be lasered either. So those are my practical uh, approaches to such a patient. Otherwise, I would continue and tell the patient that the medication has helped only to preserve your vision, not yet to restore it, and it may never restore it. Keep that in mind. We want to improve the vision, but now all it's doing is preserving. So there is, there is a rare patient that the leakage is coming from one area, giving a circinate ring going into the fovea. And I agree with Larry. I think laser is a great treatment for that patient. Unfortunately, well, there are- Well, Shats and Pats originally yeah. did that, as you recall, when Howie was at, uh, and I have their slides. I, once, I wanted to show them to people. They, the leakage in those few patients that benefited was- produced by a grid form of treatment. And it seemed to affect the posterior blood retinal barrier rather than the inner retinal barrier where the leakage was coming from the retinal circulation, superficial mostly, but also deep. So 
that has never been answered scientifically as to benefit. Okay, so, so Larry, we are looking at protocol V, the laser group, which is a third of the patients, and we're looking to see if we can pick out features on the clinical exam of the fluorescein that predict that those patients would do well with focal laser. And so we may be able to answer your question. So far, yeah. we're impressed how rare the patients are that really have just one area that's weak. Uh, some of you younger people may want to look back at that paper by Schatz and Pats on grid laser in the macula and diabetic edema. And, but look at the fluorescenes carefully and you'll see that the early stage angiograms, there's not much uh, action coming from the retinal circulation. Dr. Jampol, we have about um, 20 minutes for your next lecture. Um, and then... Uh, Steve Arshinoff, the other past president of the TOS, is going to um, uh, show you a little thank you, uh, and then we'll have a, a little bit of time for Q&A after that. Okay. Um, your slide- Can we give him 21 that? minutes, Deepa? Can you give him 21 minutes? <laughs> okay, do I hear 22? <laughs> okay, so 23. <laughs> Larry, be quiet. You're using up my time. So. Okay. So can we get my slides up there? Oh, that's good. Okay. All right. So I, we need to talk about proliferative disease, and we want to talk about protocol S, and we particularly want to talk about PRP versus anti-VEGF for proliferative disease. So I'll try to move things along, but I'll try to deal with that point. Next slide. Okay, so we all know this, and Larry and I were doing this years ago. Um, we started with the xenon arc photocoagulator. Next slide. Probably too many spots there. And then these three drugs came along, which are very powerful VEGF inhibitors. Next slide. So we wanted to try to figure out which is better, PRP or anti-VEGF. Okay. So why would... Uh, so we have eyes with proliferative disease, type 1 or type 2, no history of PRP, uh, best corrective vision uh, could be bad, 23, 20 or better, although you'll see most of the patients have very good vision. They could have central edema to start with or no central edema to start with. And we wanted to compare the efficacy of ranibizumab versus uh, PRP. Next slide. So we got 394 eyes. Uh, you can see that um, the follow-up at five years was, was not great, but the follow-up at two years was excellent. So we're going to give you both of those. Um, so the 86 and 88 percent of two years, that was the primary endpoint, but we did follow the patients longer. Next slide. Uh, their visions were surprisingly good for proliferative disease, 2320 was the mean. And most of them didn't have much thickening in the macula, you can see. Two thirds of them were normal thickness. Okay. Next slide. And only oh, a quarter of them had center involving edema with visual acuity loss, which we had we have had to uh, treat with, with ranibizumab. So we didn't ignore that. If you had DME in either group, you got ranibizumab. So therefore we're comparing ranibizumab in the blue there with PRP, with ranibizumab as needed for DME in the right group also. Okay, so, so the PRP group got some PRP, uh, some uh, anti-VEGF. All right, so the vision was good to start treatments. Let's do that. So the ranibizumab group got seven shots in the first year. They were treated until their disease became inactive. The PRP group was treated if they had DME only, and you can see a lot less shots there. And then um, the ranibizumab group settled out about three shots a year to keep the disease quiescent. And the PRP group required almost no shots at the year one. Okay, so 19 over five years. Um, so who received PRP in the ranibizumab group? Uh, if that was done, if the ranibizumab wasn't working and they got retinal detachments and vit vit vitreous hemorrhage, et cetera. Well, only 14% got PRP. And those 14% were mostly in patients that required vitrectomy 
of the detached renal hemorrhage. So very few people had to go ahead and do PRP in the office for the ravages in that group. And the ones that went through the surgery, they had to get PRP. They had to get um, uh, PRP at the time of surgery only. The PRP group, a very large proportion of them got more PRP, okay? You can see half of them getting more PRP. Uh, but that was just touch up usually. Okay. Um, visual acuity in the two groups, let's look at that. So we go out to five years here. That's two years and that's five years. So at the beginning, the ranibizumab group was doing better visual acuity wise. And um, my interpretation of that is that they had some degree of DME present affecting their vision, which got better initially. But by two years, that difference was not statistically different in terms of vision. And by five years, they were exactly the same in terms of visual acuity. So five years follow-up, no difference in vision between the two different plans. Uh, two years of follow-up, no difference at that point. Although during the first two years, the manifest group did better overall. Okay, next slide. So no difference in five years. Okay, what about looking at 15 lettuce improvement in five years, 10 lettuce improvement? So at 15 lettuce was the same, 10 lettuce almost the same, 10 lettuce worsening the same, 15 lettuce worsening. So overall, both groups were doing well at five years. Now remember that some of the PRP group got, especially the first year, got some ranibizumab, and a few of the ranibizumab people got PRP, but mostly at the time of surgery and only a small number. Okay, next slide. Now, what about developing DME if they didn't have it at the beginning? Some of them, some of them had it at the beginning, okay? So they got 2032 or worse and got thickening. So you can see that about a third of the PRP group did get thickening uh, that required treatment and about a fifth of the ranibizumab group got thickening with the decreased vision. Okay, next slide. So we looked at the diabetic retinopathy scale and I spent a fair amount of time talking to the residents about that. But less than 60, the top line means that they had no proliferative disease at all visible. That's the same. 61A regressed neovascularization, the same active neovascularization, the same. Okay. And uh, you can't compare in terms of the uh, better than 61 because that PRP makes them a 61. That's a little complicated. But anyway, it's all the same between the two groups. Next. Okay. Uh, adverse events. So, Interestingly, in the PRP group, there were less retinal detachments, but retinal detachments involving the center of the macula were rare in both groups, okay, 4% versus 1%. And the other complications were uh, basically the same as five years. So the one hint that ranibizumab might be better based upon the data I've gone over so far is the development of any retinal detachment. Okay, next slide. Safety, um, there's nothing there in terms of ocular events, difference between the two groups. Next slide. And systemic adverse events were the same. So uh, they were both equally safe treatments for the rest of the patient. Next slide. So to summarize, uh, Although again, we tried really hard. These are very sick patients with proliferative disease. We only got back two thirds of them. The number of visits over five years was more in the ranibizumab group because they were getting more shots. The ranibizumab group got 19 shots over five years, not, not terrible. And there was no difference in terms of the side effects. Next slide. So the retention wasn't great. That's the major limitation. Next slide. So why should you do? You saw in the vote there, it was pretty close as to what you would start with. And there were a lot of people that did both. So what can I say about that? So um, what should you use? Well, there's the availability of the drug. If you're 
um, drug is not available, um, you do PRP. If you're in West Africa and you don't have availability of anti-VEGF, the PRP is a great treatment. So both are excellent treatments. Uh, visit compliance. If the patient never kept any appointments before or you have reason to suspect that they're not going to come back, then PRP is the way to go. Now, the caveat with that is that sometimes university professors here in Chicago and elsewhere don't come back for their visits. So you can't just say he's a professor of history, he's complying. You can't do that. So you have to be aware that even people that you think are gonna come back may not come back. The number of visits is much better in the PRP group and the cost of the drug is obviously much better in the PRP group and their systemic health in terms of their ability to come back uh, and desire to come back. If they're in a nursing home, that's a factor. Okay, next slide. Um, so since we published that study, there have been some retrospective data reported about patients treated initially with anti-VEGF who didn't come back. And this is a very important point and don't interpret our results as saying that you should always start with anti-VEGF because that's just not true. Because if the patient doesn't come back, you can get into real trouble. And the combination of PRP and anti-VEGF, which a few of you are doing to begin with, is a very interesting possibility because it has the disadvantages to some extent of both treatments. And we don't know if it has any advantage over the uh, monotherapy. So it's theoretical and people are doing it, but interesting, they're all doing it in different ways. They're giving PRP first and then anti-VEGF, vice versa, simultaneous. They're doing modified PRPs, half the number of spots. We just don't have any evidence whether the combination is better than, than the two we have here. Okay, so particularly than anti-VEGF alone. So um, I suspect a lot of our investigators are doing combinations of stuff, but the DRCR cannot help you decide whether to do combinations. So if you look at the faculty here at Northwestern, uh, some of the retina people are believers in always starting in a reliable patient with anti-VEGF. Others say that I want to start with a combination. Um, and I think we all agree that if the patient's not coming back, the PRP is the way to go. Next slide, let's see if we have any more. Oh, okay. Uh, are we out of time or there was one other thing I could cover quickly? Uh, yeah, we have about um, seven minutes. Okay, so one advantage of PRP, oh, you're going to like this part. One advantage of PRP, one disadvantage is that you lose field. And we all know that. Um, interestingly, many of the patients are not symptomatic from that field loss, but there's no doubt that they lose field right away. And so the anti-VEGF group, we thought, wouldn't lose field. And so we ought to do the visual field testing. And we did that over five years in a subset of patients where the perimeter, the golden, the uh, Humphrey perimeter was available. Okay, so we did the Humphrey 30-2 plus 60-4. And at two years, remember that was the first endpoint of the study, look what happened. Just about what we expected, the Ranibizumab group lost no field that we could detect, and the um, PRP group lost 400 um, points, which is a significant field loss. I can't tell you. We, we uh, have field experts on this. That's a very significant field loss over two years. And we, you know, we were excited about that, and we discussed that in the primary paper. This is a reason you should consider Ranibizumab. But there's a couple things in this graph that we should have paid attention to. And if we had more time, I'd have some of you try to guess. But if you look at the ranibizumab group, they continue to lose field beyond uh, one year, okay? And we didn't expect that. So when we come out to five years, we'll see more of this. Um, okay, so we did a five-year follow-up on the visual fields and it's similar. Okay, let's, let's move on. We're looking at the total point scores and uh, over five years, okay. Next. Okay, so uh, unfortunately after five years, the subgroup of patients we had on the left 
we only got back, uh, you can see 80s in each group, okay? But there was no difference between them and the ones that we didn't have follow up fields on. Next slide. So the weakness of this study is not a lot of our patients had five year fields, but the results are, are worth uh, looking at. Next slide. Okay, next slide. All right, so uh, if we look at the 30-2 and visual field testing, I think I'm gonna go into the main cumulative score slide. Next, let's go to that. So this is two years, what we expected, and now we go to five years. So the ranibizumab group continues to go down. We didn't expect that, and we can't explain that by any additional laser that was done. Uh, we can't explain that by catalysts easily. We can't explain that by anything, except what I'll come to in a second. And the, and the ranibizumab group shows a drop in loss from two years to five years even though very few of them, as I showed you, got, got the surgery or PRP. So what's going on here? Well, I think I briefly mentioned this and I just mentioned it more this morning, that this evidence accumulated in the diabetic lenopathy is in neuropathy and that the vascular changes that we see and that we rate in our exams and with our DRSS levels may be a secondary phenomenon and that the disease can continue to progress in the face of PRP or anti-VEGF. So what's the evidence for that? Let's go on to the next slide. I don't know if I have any slides to show. So this is really interesting. Um, okay, let's take, let's skip this slide. So we can't explain it um, by, by, uh, by PRP being the reason. Next. But we found that, that uh, the first PRP was, did make things worse after a few more PRPs, but that was not explaining the drop in the PRP group. And the laser and the ranibizumab group didn't explain the drop either. Next slide. So the vi visual field loss dropped in both groups from years two to five. If we remove the visual field data on the PRP patients that didn't help us, it still remained. Next slide. So this may be a neurodegeneration. Uh, this is probably new information to most of you that may depend on the duration of diabetes and may precede the diabetic retinopathy that we can see or see on our multimodal imaging. Next slide. This is supported by the fact that at the beginning of our study, before any PRP or ranibizumab, they had very abnormal peripheral visual fields. Okay? So we think that shows that this is a, a neural disease to begin with. And there are other groups who are studying animals with diabetes and things that have evidence to support that. Next slide. And there's also the CLARITY study, which compared a flibicep versus PRP. And they found that their fields also were diminishing in both groups. And they also found that the peripheral perfusion on the fluorescein angiogram, the aptos fluorescein, was getting worse in both groups also. So, so the field's getting worse and the perfusion on peripheral angiography is getting worse despite anti-VEGF or PRP. So that makes us think that maybe this is, um, let's skip this one, maybe this is a neuropathy. Dr. Jempel, an excellent uh, question from Hisham in the um, audience is uh, of course we're concerned about causing or accelerating glaucoma or ocular hypertension in our injection patients. Uh, perhaps their average IOP um, was stable, um, but is it possible that intermittent IOP spikes after each injection could have le led to the progression of these visual fields? Okay, <clears throat> so it's a very complicated issue, but let me say that eyes that are getting a lot of shots uh, it is observed that there is a low incidence of open angle glaucoma that develops in Bailey Freund. And New York has done a lot of work on this, and we have also in the diabetic cases. About 3% of the patients a year go on to develop elevated pressure on a chronic basis, not glaucoma, but elevated pressure. So that's, that's not a factor. Now, in the ranibizumab group, could the initial rise in pressure when you put the needle in there 
can be doing damage to the field, and that's that's possible. Okay, we don't think so, but that's possible that the spike of pressure that you're getting each time. But remember, the other thing to keep in mind is that the diabetic macular edema patients and the PDR patients are getting many fewer shots than the AMD patients. And after the first year, they get very, very few shots. So the progression of the field that we see between two and five years is very unlikely to be related to just a few shots during those years. But can I rule that out completely? No. Okay. Uh, let's go one more slide, I think. Okay, so could cannabis not be harmful? More shots? Yes. Okay, next slide, but probably not. So, next slide. So, in eyes with protocol less, had substantial visual field at baseline, scattered laser treatment was, was associated with slightly larger field loss, but it didn't explain the drop in either the ratibizumab group or the PRP group after two years. Okay. So it's very intriguing. Whenever you, I said this before, whenever you do a study and you see something you totally don't expect, like the loss of field in the ranibizumab group, it opens up new vistas for you. And we're looking into those things. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jampel, for squeezing in so many lectures um, in this period of time. Um, if you want to just end your, or Peng, if you want to end the screen share, uh, Dr. Steve Arshinoff, the, um, the past president of the Toronto Ophthalmological Society, just wants to say thank you. And then we will um, open up uh, the panel um, for questions for the last um, 10 minutes. Okay, thanks, Deepa. Um, hope you can hear me. Yes, uh, you can share your screen also whenever you're ready, Steve. I will soon, okay. Um, I wanna thank you very much, Lee. I must say it was probably more fun sharing a taxi with you in Rome a few times about a year ago, and it was socially much more interesting. We had a great event planned for you with all of the ophthalmologists in the TOS and at university uh, for last night. Unfortunately, we have just pictures instead. That's what everybody in the world has, so we have to deal with that. We want to thank you for putting up with the changes in our schedule uh, for all the difficulties in that. And I want to tell you that I'm thanking you now, not just on behalf of the Toronto Ophthalmology Society, but the university as well, because you may have seen me grabbing my phone back and forth between Deepa contacting me and then Sharif saying he had to leave. I now have two jobs. But fortunately for us, the TOS is unusual and with the university in that we get along probably far better than most sort of town gown organizations. Most members of the university staff are also members of the TOS and most members of the TOS are also involved with the university. So we wanna thank you for, well, we thought you would come to enlighten us and we know fully well that Dr. Yanuzi doesn't really watch every uh, presentation online that he uh, comes along, but it must be a special speaker to do so. That's a great compliment for you. He uh, is. But we had, we thought you'd come to us and give us answers to all the questions we had about our diabetics. And you gave us maybe seven or eight answers with huge amounts of research and studies that probably left us with 500 questions. So that's the way the world goes, I guess. But we're very grateful for you doing this and for all of the uh, efforts. And for that, I'll just share my screen. Um, and then, I will put this up and show you what we have for you. This is not quite the same as being able to uh, give you something in person. And it didn't come out as well as I'd hoped to share it. Uh, but this is basically a thank you card. Sorry that the blue came out and stripes should be solid. So we have some irises for you, not quite uh, Van Gogh and not quite real. And we can print it better than it came out on the screen because on my screen it comes out better, but not here. Uh, we want to just thank you for, on behalf of the university and the Toronto Ophthalmology Society for making the effort to enlighten us about diabetes for which we have uh, eternal problems. Uh, it seems that when you describe your patients, they're much like our patients. And the fact that some don't come back very often is the same thing we have. And so we learned a lot from you. And I think everybody really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Hopefully next time it'll be maybe in Rome or somewhere else in a taxi or some beautiful restaurant in Toronto. 
Um, and we hope to see more of you again soon. That's great. So, so this is my first real, uh, you know, multi-hour presentation. I thought it went very well, and that's due to the work that your people did. And uh, I'll remember that when I come back to Toronto, you owe me dinner. Okay, well, that, no problem with that. Don't forget that taxi ride also. <laughs> the taxi uh, rides were good in the road. Okay, that was great, thank you. I got the front seat and you put him in the back seat because he's skinnier and he runs. <laughs> Um, Amandeep, do you want to put up the results uh, from the first poll question while uh, the panelists, um, uh, just before the panelists start answering, the, uh, asking questions? While you're doing that, Deepa, I think this concept about the uh, effect on the optic nerve is very important. I was on another conference yesterday that had to do about the Novartis anti-VEGF medication. And some of those eyes, a small percentage of them had significant optic nerve uh, change, which they will uh, open to the public. And I think people who have seen the cases will. Well, the same thing is going on with diabetes. Uh, I used to think that it was the peripheral retina progressive ischemia producing the field loss. And then I thought it was the disc from glaucoma, but these eyes do not get cupping necessarily as the typical glaucomatous eye or even the post ischemic optic neuropathy eye gets. It's just a pallor. Uh, it's a pallor like you get with a generalized uh, retinal degeneration. So we don't have the idea. Maybe, maybe the drug has some effect at inducing a toxic effect, but I'm glad you call it to our attention, Lee, because that has to be addressed. Thank you. So Larry, in the animal models, the ganglion cells are dropping out. So that, that's probably the explanation. Um, Dr. Jean Paul, here, here's a question as a VR surgeon. Um, in the past, you know, we always looked at vitreous and vitrectomies and the surgeries for uh, PDR and then obviously on DME. What's your thoughts now on the, the importance of the vitreous and the hyaloid now with the anti-VEGF era? How do we deal with that? So vitreal macular traction? VMP, vitreous traction, and the actual hyaloid, just even VMA on, on uh, diabetic macular edema and, and potentially PDR. Okay, so so most of us feel, um, not everyone, that uh, if you have habitual macular traction in most eyes with DME doesn't play a major role. On the other hand, there are some uh, what I'll call beaten up eyes where uh, the vitreal retinal interface does appear to be important and they don't respond to anti-VEGF. And perhaps in those eyes, a vitrectomy and epiretinal membrane peeling might be helpful. But there isn't good evidence for that right now. So, so most of our investigators are not doing vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema. So, so was there a difference between the eyes treated with the anti-VEGF versus photocoagulation with the advent uh, or the outcome of uh, vitreoretinal retinal traction of detachment? Um, yeah, so detachments were more common in the, um, let me make sure I get this right. Detachments were more common in the PRP group than they were in the anti-VEGF group. So well, was that significant? Uh, it was significant, yeah. So it, it may well be that, it, uh, but interestingly, most of the attachments didn't get back to the fovea in this period of time. But if you want to avoid, if you have a traction detachment and you want to avoid uh, progression, then my feeling is, and we don't have firm evidence in this, that anti-VEGF is actually better than PRP. Now, people were worried about the so-called Avastin crunch, where you would give anti-VEGF and the proliferative disease would shrink up and pull the retina off. We don't see that in eyes with this degree of, of retinopathy. And if anything, I just told you there's less traction detachments in the eyes getting the ranibizumab. So I think that's a misnomer. Now, in very severe eyes, if you have a patient that comes in and they're already pulling off the arcades and the macula is detached. Will anti-VEGF be harmful in that situation? I don't know. 
But in most patients, even when they have some element attraction detachment away from the macula, the anti-VEGF does, group does better. So any eye that is headed for a vitrectomy, would you treat with an anti-VEGF first before the vitrectomy? Yeah, so, okay, so most of our investigators do do that. We don't dictate that to them. And I think most of the doctors in Northwestern here do do that for a, a you know, period of time before the surgery to diminish the amount of leakage and bleeding at the time of surgery. So that's I think done that, in our group as well. That's probably standard. Dr. Jampel, I have a question. I want also want to precede that with a comment of, of thanking you for doing this wonderful lecture uh, today and also for residents and also for your significant role in the RCR retina network and establishing it and sustaining it. It is where it is really because of you and uh, folks like you. So we really want to thank you for that. Thank you. And I'll, the, I'll just say that there's like 140 of us that do this thing. So it's really... But I know your role has been very, very critical. Uh, <laughs> but the question is, uh, for the protocol S patients uh, who get ranibizumab year two to five, uh, the number of injections goes down after year one to just three or under three. Do you think that sort of low number of injections leads to more peripheral ischemia? And if we had sustained the injections to a higher number, that would have prevented this peripheral loss? Oh, I love this question because I thought this was in one of my lectures either this morning or now. There's a group in France, um, Alain Galdrick and Ramin Tadayoni, who have done some beautiful peripheral UCT angiograms on patients that looking at the capillary bed in the periphery of the retina in patients that are getting anti-VEGF treatments. And there's no evidence that reperfusion occurs. And there is evidence, there's some evidence that the perfusion progresses despite the anti-VEGF. So I don't believe that anti-VEGF is preventing progression of non-perfusion. And that goes along with the neuropathy theory. That's one of the reasons I'm, I'm uh, interested in that. I, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for your. Hello, Hello, I, I have Thank a question you, about. Oh, yep. Sorry, Lee, I have a question about how you dealt with the loss of follow ups in Protocol S. So they lost about 35% of the patients. Well, from years two to five, how did you deal with those losses to follow up? So as a clinical trialist, there is no good way to deal with loss to follow up. And avoiding it is the only thing. I can, can't tell you in those two five-year studies how much time we spent getting the patients, trying to get the patients back, finding them, examining them, looking for other sites where we could see them, et cetera. So looking at death records to find out who was dead, national death records, et cetera. A huge amount of time. So that's the best you can do in that patient population. So you can look at the risk factors at baseline for the ones that you lost the follow-up and the ones that you're still following. So again, if the lost the follow-up group has an A1C of 12 and the ones that are coming back have an A1C of 6, you could possibly try a correction for that, okay? And try to predict what might have happened if we had followed them up. Um, so you look at the demographics, you look at the number of shots they've gotten over the first two years, you look at the vision at two years, you look at the central subfield thickness at two years, and you try to see if there are any obvious differences um, that might make the loss of follow-up group very different than the group we followed. And the answer is that they're, they're, they're rather similar. Okay? Uh, the vision's a little worse. Um, in the ones that are lost to follow up and initiation of the study. But in general, all of their characteristics are very similar. The ones that are lost to follow up are older, they're sicker, um, and you can't, you can't really correct for that. But well, what did you do with the data? Did you take the last observation and carry it forward? Or no, you can't do that to five years. No, sometimes no. when you're missing a data point, you can do that. But in a five year study, you couldn't do that. If someone was lost to follow up, it, one month, you can't carry it out to five years. So, okay. so, what, that. so what did you do though in protocol S? So we just analyzed the data that we have on the patients that we've examined. Okay. And, and we clearly point out everywhere that that's a weakness of the study. But, but in my own head, having seen uh, the study, I think that's a weakness, but I, I believe the results that in five years, they're, they're very similar in vision. Well, 
Dr. Um, Jempel. Dr. Jempel, unfortunately, we do have to end. Um, thank you very much uh, to uh, the panelists, uh, Peter, Panos, uh, David, Dnupra, uh, Kayvon, Pang, and most importantly, <laughs> Dr. Yanutsi, who um, added a lot of color to this conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Steve. And um, on behalf of the TOS, we thank you as well. Uh, John Lloyd and Sharif um, and Amandeep um, may have some uh, housekeeping announcements for next week. And thank you again, Dr. Jempel. This was a true treat. And for your first time using Zoom uh, for all these lectures, that was very impressive. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, every thank you everyone. Um, and um, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. So uh, next week we'll have a neuro ophthalmology round with Dr. Ed Margolin. Um, the links will be again available via the listservs as well as on the departmental website. And I also want to plug the departmental website as we will be posting uh, past rounds, including today's rounds, directly on there. So for those of who have been asking how they can access previous rounds, the website is now functional. And I'll give it over to John Lloyd. You have to unmute yourself. I got it. <laughs> right. Final thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, special thanks to our, uh, our guest speaker. It was uh, fantastic. Even for uh, a LASIK surgeon, it was pretty darn interesting. So, and also thanks to uh, Deepa and Steve as uh, our TOS representatives um, and uh, uh, here who had uh, a lot to do in arranging this. Uh, thank you very, very much for your help. It was a great success, even if we weren't at a spectacular venue as we have been in the past. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks all.